Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to grab my stand over here. Well, good morning, church. Levi, you want to grab this thing before I step on it? I don't know how much it's worth. Hey, my name is Jeremy. If you're new, I'm one of the pastors here. and want to welcome all of our campuses. If you're unaware, we're a uh, multi-site church. We're one church in multiple locations, and um, we're happy to be here. I want to welcome all of our locations as well as our online viewers. Last week, we started a brand new message series, as you can see on the uh, TV here, called Luke. Season two, some of you are wondering, well, what was season one? Uh, Season one was last January, we started studying through the gospel of Luke. There's four eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're in your New Testament. And we started studying through Luke chapter one through 15, we made it through. Easter happened, we did some other series and other studies, we're picking it back up, and last week we looked at chapter 16, the importance of being good stewards with what God has given us to make an eternal difference. This week, I want to talk to you about this idea of being a servant. So I've titled my message simply this, it's a pleasure to serve, it's a pleasure to serve, and I thought immediately of a place where my son Aiden, he's 18 years old, works, and that is Chick-fil-A. Just curious, how many Chick-fil-A lovers out there today? Any, anyone? There's a lot here. Um, and whether you live close to a Chick-fil-A or not, sorry to rub it in the other campuses because you don't. Um, even if you don't live next to one, you probably love Chick-fil-A. I think it's kind of common knowledge that it's the um, unofficial restaurant of a Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christian, right? I think there's a verse in Leviticus, Leviticus 3.16, that says, you know, thou shalt love Chick-fil-A or something like that. Not, not really. Don't quote me on that. But why is this restaurant so popular? You ever thought about that? They literally serve fried chicken, white bread, and a pickle. Like, how did they get so popular? I'll tell you why. It's not because the chicken, although the chicken's really good. It's really moist and tender. I had it last night. And it's not because of the fries, although the waffle fries are pretty amazing. We can all agree. And it's not because of the hand-spun milkshakes, but those things are delicious, right? It's not because of any of the menu items. What Chick-fil-A is known for more than its food is what? It's service, right? Like when you ask for more of that yummy Chick-fil-A sauce, and they give you like a little too much excitement, Brian, but I'm I'm with you. I appreciate it. But they give you that Chick-fil-A sauce that you probably have five or six packets of in your junk drawer right now, probably. You say thank you, and what do they say? My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for that refill, sir. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Pleasure. They, they say that. Uh, just ask Aiden, who works at Chick-fil-A. They are trained to serve. They are trained to serve with pleasure. And uh, these employers of the Chick-fil-A kingdom, they're kind of hiding behind the back, behind the counter, just waiting for you to ask for your seventh refill of cherry Coke, just to say, my pleasure, right? It's kind of creepy, kind of creepy, but it's part of their culture, right? They love to serve with pleasure. And I think what is true of the Chick-fil-A kingdom should be true of God's kingdom and his people. If I could put it like this, Christians should love to serve others with pleasure. The way that we say it at our core values, these banners around our sanctuaries at all of our locations, one of them is saved people serve people. Save people is just another name for being a Christian because we're saved from something to something. We're saved for the presence of God, and we're saved not just to have that as a benefit, but to serve other people. To be a follower of Jesus by nature means to be a servant. It means to be a servant. And the reason why is because when we think about all that Jesus has done for us and how he has served us, He's given us eternal life. He's redeemed us from the past. He's given us a future. He's given us grace upon grace and mercy every 24 hours. How could we not but help serve him with pleasure? And so today I want to talk to you about 
how it's a pleasure, it should be a pleasure to serve from Luke chapter 17. I'm just going to share four verses with you today. The first three are the parable. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And then the last verse that we'll look at, verse 10 of chapter 17, will serve as our application. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. They're in the seat back in front of you, or you can just follow along on this screen. Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. This is a story that Jesus shares, and he says this, Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Church, I think more than anything, what this passage serves us in learning more about Jesus today is why we serve. It's the why behind the what that this passage is speaking to. And so what I want to talk about today is why, why do we serve, like why do you serve and why as pastors and elders at your local congregation, why do we even ask you to serve? Like why do we ask you to get plugged into opportunities? Why do we emphasize, hey, it's important church to be in the community and serve those um, who, who maybe you don't even like to get involved with people who are struggling to serve, serve, serve. Why do we even say that? I have, I have three thoughts to share with you this morning. I'm gonna give you them up front. I'm gonna give you them up front so you know where we're going and then we're gonna talk about each of them, but my first three, my first points are this, that service is a part of our obedience, service is a part of our duty, our purpose, and that service is a part of our worship, okay? Obedience, duty, worship. So here's point number one. I think we serve because service is a part of our obedience. Wah, wah, I know, right? Service is, uh, obedience is not a, a trending term in our culture. It's not a pop, popular idea, but it is expected of Christ followers. And more than just expected of us as Christians, it's kind of assumed, it's kind of assumed by Jesus that people who know Jesus, follow Jesus, serve. Like, it's, 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 you should expect that. It, it should be assumed. And the reason why I say that is because of verse 10. Look what it says in verse 10. He says, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded. Like when, like not if, but when you do this. So Jesus is assuming something in this passage, that if you follow me, you do what I do, and I serve, so therefore you as a follower were commanded to serve, and so you're you're supposed to do it. Now, the other thing I thought was interesting in verse 10 is it says, when you have done So according to Jesus, what's important here is not necessarily what you know, but what you do. And there's a lot of people who know about the Bible, but never do the Bible. It's called disobedience, and it's not honoring to God. And so we we don't want to just be people, and this is why the church gets criticized a lot of times. We, We know things, but we don't do them. Jesus is calling us to know things, to live it out, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, A great question that my friend and and ministry coach, that I have an older gentleman who um, prays with me, keeps me accountable, and and just iron sharpens iron, more him sharpening me. But he has this great question that he's been asking recently to himself and to to me, and that is this question. Will what I do please God? Like, how am I I living? Uh, What am I thinking? What am I acting on? Is what I'm doing pleasing to God? That's a great question to kind of filter every life choice and every life thought that you have because it's a question of two things. It's a question of obedience and it's a question of affection. Do you, like, is your heart's desire at the end of the day when you lay your head down on the pillow, is it to truly serve God with all your heart and being obedient to him in every area of your life. Now, some people might hear that and think, well, hey, Jeremy, I thought it was like God's plan and his, his responsibility to do for me what I could not do for myself. Like he's, he's supposed to be the substitute for me because I could not live a perfect and obedient life. And that's true. That's what we believe the gospel is. The good news of Jesus Christ is that Jesus is our substitute. He's our substitute because we sinned, and so he is the sacrifice to pay for our sin. But he's also the substitute to live the life that we could not live, that we were supposed to live. And so we know from Scripture, plain and clear, that we can only know God by grace. 
And we can only be right with God by grace, but we're still called to obey him and to serve him with grace. And so I would say this, while we can know God by grace alone, we're still called to obey him. The difference now is we don't try to earn our salvation by obeying, but rather obedience is the fruit of our salvation. In other words, I would say it like this. Now that you're a Christian, it's not about earning or striving. It's about honoring. And because you're, the dynamic in which you have changed in your relationship with God, you don't have to earn anymore. But because of everything that he's done for you, you want to honor him with the life that he has given you and serve him. So we no longer have a to-do list. We have a substitute. We no longer have a list of have-tos. We have a list of get-tos. We get to serve our Heavenly Father. We, we no longer need to be afraid of God over his anger, over our sin. Why would we? We're children. We're children of God, and therefore we honor him with the life that he has given us. Uh, as Jesus said in John chapter 15 or 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So church, if we love Jesus, if we truly love Jesus, obedience to his word to reach out to the least of these and to be the hands and feet of Jesus will be first and foremost on our minds. That love will lead to obedience. His substitutionary work on our behalf always leads to a life of obedience through service. So if you think about it, obedience is not anti-gospel, all right? It's not anti-grace. It's actually the fruit of the gospel. It's the fruit of God's grace in our lives. Because if Jesus has done this, we desire to be servants for him. That's first and foremost. I know I threw a lot at you, but it's on purpose, because it's so foundational for why we do what we do as a church and why we should have a heart of servanthood. That when we're inconvenienced, we choose to do the right thing. We serve others who need to know Jesus. Amen? So that's number one. Number two is this. Number two is service is a part of our duty. You say, well, what's the difference between duty and obedience? I think duty, in which he uses in this verse that we're going to talk about, has a lot to do with how we were made. It's the way in which we were created. Think again. Saved people who have been transformed by Jesus should serve people. So look again at the second half of verse 10. He says, say we are unworthy servants. We're unworthy servants. We're not just servants, but we were unworthy to do this high calling that Jesus has called us to do. We have only done what was our duty. When we're saved by Jesus, here's what I want you to, I want you to know. We have a new identity. We were once servants to sin, and now we get to be servants to Jesus. Actually, we weren't just servants. We were slaves to sin. Christ gave us a new identity. So think about this. We're slaves. We're free only to become servants again. We're slaves where we have no choice but to obey sin and sinful temptation. God frees us, redeems us, restores our heart, gives us a new desire so that we can become servants once again. We no longer have to, but we get to. As Jesus said of himself, he said something interesting in, in Matthew. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I just think it's so incredible. When, when Christ calls us to do our duty as unworthy servants, it's incredible to think that we get to follow in his footsteps, knowing how God has served us. God literally, the incarnation, we just celebrated Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us, came to this earth washing people's feet. Uh, my wife and I, at our, our wedding, we washed each other's feet, which for those on the outside of Christianity, you think, well, that's really, really weird. Like, we fumbled and stumbled, and it was a really awkward moment trying to get my shoe untied because it was in a knot. And it was like this awkward moment, but it was a beautiful moment where she finally got my shoes off, I got her shoes off, and we washed each other's feet. And from the outside, that makes no sense at all. But for those who know Jesus, it makes absolutely perfect sense because we're only doing what Christ has commanded us to do. We get low and we serve. We serve, we serve, we serve because that's how God served us. If you think about how God served you, he welcomed you to the family table. Isn't that cool? He redeemed you of a horrible past, something that you're probably very ashamed of. He set your feet on a rock, gave you a new purpose, grace for today, hope for tomorrow. Like He did all that for us. And he says, I want you to follow in my footsteps. I don't know if you know this, but the term Christian literally means little Christ ones. It was actually a derogatory term that the people in the first century used to speak of Jesus' followers, that we 
we accept and we embrace because why we want to become like Christ. Who is Christ? The Son of Man came not to serve, but to, not to be served, but to serve. So if that's our leader, that he came to serve, not to be served, then it stands to reason that his followers also serve. Leader goes, we as followers go after him, and that means we become servants. Um, great example that I want to share with you from the life of Paul. Uh, Paul, if you know, wrote 13 books of the New Testament that you have a part of your Bible. He planted a bunch of churches around the Mediterranean Rim, and he wrote letters to those churches, one of which was a church in Rome. And at the beginning of all these letters, he introduces himself, just like you would introduce yourself in the beginning of a letter. And this is how he introduces himself in the beginning of Romans. He says, Paul, hi, I'm Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, which means sent one, set apart for the gospel of God. And then he writes all these chapters and all these words to the Romans. But before he gets into the meat of the gospel and what it's all about, he just says, hi, here's the very first thing I want you to know about me. I'm an unworthy servant. I'm, my whole life is here to serve God. Wouldn't that be cool if there's one thing you wanted others to know about you? You skipped your resume, you skipped your profile, you skipped all the Instagram pictures, you skipped all the good stuff, and you just said, the one thing I want you to know about me and understand is I am a servant of Jesus. I'm a sent one called out by God to do his work, and that is my heart's desire is to serve him with all my life. That was his identity. And so once you know that you're a servant, which hopefully you do now, and once you know why you're a servant, the next question should be, well, how do I, how do I serve God? How do I serve God? There's a couple ways. Number one, I think we serve God by, number one, serving others. Serving others. Serving others in your local sphere of influence, your circle of influence, in your work, your, your home, your neighborhood. You serve others. And let me share a few verses with you um, that maybe, you, maybe you've heard before. John 13, 35 says this. They, speaking of the world, who doesn't know Christ, they will know that you are my disciples, people who follow after Jesus, if you love one another. John 13, 35. And, and then the next verse, it says this in Matthew 23, 11, The greatest among you shall be your servant. So for those of you who want to have a, a great life, live a great life, be known, and have a legacy, Jesus' recommendation is you, you got to get low. you got to be a servant. And then in, in Romans, it says this, Romans 12, 10, Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So here's the rhythm of the Christian life. Love, serve, honor. Love, serve, honor. Love, serve, honor. If you think about it in, um, in restaurant terms, it's like being a, a good waiter. It's like being a good waiter. What does a good waiter do? Some of you know what a bad waiter does, which is like they ignore you for like a half an hour. You're like waiting for a refill. You're like, they're never around. They're never around. But a good waiter, what do they do? Before you even ask for it, that, that soda's refilled, that water's refilled. They're asking you how you're doing, almost a little annoyingly, like, but they're, they're, they're anticipating your needs. That's what a good servant does. We want to outdo one another in showing honor. We want to love and serve one another. We want to be inconvenienced even so that people can know and experience the love of Jesus. What does that mean practically? That means this happens all the time. Someone's got to move in the church. What do you do? You lend a hand. You help them move. Someone's short on their bills, and, and God has blessed you with some resources out of the abundance of what God has done for you. Write a check. Help. Help them out. Um, if, if someone needs help just in the community, you step up. If someone needs a ride, pull a dumb and dumber. Pick them up, you know, pick them up. Uh, just help. Have a heart of helping. I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So a good servant, here's what a good servant does. Again, a good servant anticipates, sees, and responds to needs. A good servant anticipates, sees, and responds to needs. This goes way beyond just serving in a program, by the way, church. Like, do we need help in, you know, kid zone and student ministry and hospitality? Yeah, yeah. But, but what I'm talking about goes well beyond programming. There are so many people in our church here at this campus and all of our campuses, when I think about people who just know Jesus and then anticipate needs, they step up into those opportunities. It's incredible. There's this, uh, I'll tell you guys about this. There's the, the campus in Shingle House. Two people in Shingle House, uh, 
I don't know, about two years ago. They just felt that God put on their heart for people who are widows or um, single moms, people that are older that can't help themselves around the house. Maybe they don't have the skills or they don't have the ability to do something that, that is needed in the house. These people started a ministry called the Hands and Feet Ministry. And that campus, what they do is rally people around those needs and they just go. They just go. They anticipate, they listen, they hear, and when the need arises, they just go and help out. I, I think about those people. I think about the people here at Greece Campus uh, uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, every Saturday morning, provide a service, a worship service for the Hilton East Nursing Home where they teach the Bible. Um, we've raised up teachers doing that, uh, worshipers. Uh, we, we do a whole service. Isn't that great, Bob? It's great to see. But servants see a need, and they go to respond to it. For years, I've been a pastor for 14 years now, men in the church, they just come out of the word work when the, the, the green grass starts to grow and they provide resources, gas, they bring their mowers to church at all of our campuses and they're like, we'll get it done. And aren't you grateful for servants when you show up and the grass is mowed? And they just step in and say in need and they anticipate it and they respond to that need. I, I, think, of, um, I think of deaconesses who at all of our campuses they serve people when they're in need. When they have a surgery or someone has a baby or when someone's sick, they, they listen. They anticipate, they see, and they respond. I think of people at all of our locations where we're kind of in between outreaches. Uh, we have had people just kind of create their own outreaches, serve hot cider and hot cocoa and hand out invites. That goes well beyond like ministry programming. That's, that's just, I know Jesus, he loves me, I want to be a servant, and therefore I'm going to anticipate, see, and respond to need both in the church as well as outside these four walls. I want to be a servant of Jesus. Um, so this is what we were called to be. The second thing, the way that we serve Jesus is by serving the local ministry of the church, the ministry of the, the local church. I, I once heard this great analogy that the church is either, to you, the church is either a hotel or a house, Okay. Uh, what do you do with a hotel? I was just in a hotel recently. Um, I'll tell you what I did. You know, I made sure the bed was made every day. I, made, I cleaned the window, cleaned the mirror, made sure my clothes were all picked up. Not. I am the biggest slob in the history of hotel stays. Like, I don't pick up nothing. Now, my wife does a little bit, but I might spit on the mirror while, when I'm brushing my teeth. The bed's definitely not getting made. I don't care if my underwear's on the floor and it's all over the place. I treat it as if I'm in a hotel because I'm in a hotel. I tried doing that in my house and my wife threatened to leave me. It didn't work out too well, but um, it's because why? We, we treat a hotel different than a home. Why is that? Why do we do that with hotels? Why do we do that with motels? Why do we do that when it's not our home? I'll, I'll give you two reasons. Maybe this will resonate. Number one is there's no ownership. I don't own that hotel. Therefore, I don't really care. There's no ownership. And number two, I don't intend to stay very long. So when there's no ownership and you don't intend to stay very long, you end up treating it like it's not your own, your home. The church was never meant to be seen as a hotel. Church is a home. It's a family where people contribute. They build up other people, the body of Christ. Why? Because we, we take ownership. In fact, our membership class, we, we love the, to use the language ownership. Like membership invokes, I have privileges and we have privileges. This is a country, it's not a country club. You're on mission with us and we want you to take ownership if this is your home church, regardless of whether or not you're a member. And w because, why? We hope that you stay long. We hope that you're not just jumping from here to here to here. Like, this is a home. This is a family that you can belong to and grow in the faith with other people. And the best thing is they've, they have spiritual gifts that, that are designed to encourage you and sharpen you and help you grow in your faith, as you do with other people as well. So we want to take ownership. We want to treat the church like a home, not a hotel. It's encouraging to think about this, though, cross on. I was thinking, well, is this a point that I should like hammer people with this week? No, I, I feel like really encouraged. Now, sometimes pastors are known for like, you know, punching you in the nose. Like you can only, my preaching professor said in college, you, people can only be punched in the nose so often. So you might not want to do that every week. 
I don't feel like I have to punch anyone in the nose this week. I feel like our church, for the most part, treats people, treats the church like a home, not, not a hotel. And that's encouraging to, to uh, see. Amen. Amen. And I hope you appreciate that. I hope you appreciate that if you have kids or grandkids, right now they're being taught about Jesus uh, in an environment that they can grow in. Why? Because we have servants. Because we have servants. Hope you appreciate if you have teenagers um, who are going through some, you know, it's a rough stage of life trying to figure things out. It's confusing. You can appreciate that we have people pouring into them, providing an environment where they can know other people and grow in their faith. Why? Because we have servants. Um, You probably walked into church today with dry feet instead of slopping through slush, probably in the other campuses especially, right? Because why? You have servants. Your prayers are being prayed for every single week because we have servants. You are literally hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth right now because we have servants. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alex. So as I can... They're panicking right now. They think that the servant left. Thank God for servants, right? Thank God for servants. So that's the second thing. Uh, so we, we serve because it's our duty. And then number three, we serve because it's, it's a part of our worship. This is, this is really big. This gets to the heart behind why we do what we do as a church. We love, we serve, we obey because we love God, period. That's why we do what we do. You know, at the end of the day, when we stand before Jesus, we're going to get rewarded based on what we do here on this earth with what God has given us. That's cool. We get rewards. We get treasures. That's cool. But at the end of the day, what we're going to do with those rewards, we're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus anyway. It's all for him. Everything we do for him, he's our motivation behind everything as well. So that means that everything that we do in the church should be motivated by wanting to worship him. He's our motivation. When we become a Christian, okay, when I became a Christian, Motivations changed. I started serving other people for a different reason, whereas before I used to serve to get something, right? Did the chores to get my allowance. I did some serving in the community to get a reward or notice, a recognition in high school. That's why I served. But when I became a Christian, motivations changed. That's the difference between Christians and non-Christians, by the way. I know a lot of non-Christians that would put Christians to shame when it comes to serving. Um, That's not what distinguishes non-Christians from Christians. It's not serving. They both serve. What distinguishes a Christian from a non-Christian is why they serve. Whereas I used to serve to get something from someone, now I serve simply to bless God. So that means that when we serve, our reward is not a pat on the back. It's not getting noticed, and sometimes there's a temptation there to get noticed for what you do. It's not any of that. Our reward is God. Our reward is God. Our reward is not being recognized. Our reward is God. Our reward is not even a treasure that we're going to get, a reward that we're going to get someday in heaven. Our reward is ultimately being in the presence of God forever in heaven. That is what, this is why we do what we do. So as I close, I want to share with you one verse that I just kept coming back to this past week that maybe would resonate with you. It's in the Psalms. It's in the Old Testament poetry. And uh, I think it's David who wrote this. He says, for a day in your courts, is better than a thousand elsewhere. He's, um, he's picturing heaven. He's picturing his eternal home. He's picturing what's to come. He's getting out of the, the temporal and getting his mind focused on the eternal. And he says, it's better to be in your presence. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. What's a doorkeeper? A doorkeeper is a servant. That's where a doorkeeper is. Would you rather be a doorkeeper, a servant in the household and the kingdom of God than be like every other person on this globe who is pursuing things that are not of God? We can get so caught up in the rat race and busy ourselves with time and energy and money into things that don't matter in eternity. We talked about that last week. Or we can invest our lives into the one thing that matters, which is people. Serving them when they least expect it, least deserve it, because that was a part of your story. You know, when I was 16 years old, I came to know Christ 
not because of any paid pulpit preacher professional. I came to know Christ through a public earth science teacher in my local high school who just served me. He just served me. He reached out to me, got to know me, we found some common interests, and he served me. And he shared the gospel with me, he shared scripture with me, I gave my life to Christ. And for the last 26 years, God has placed people in my life, not professionals, lay people, regular people, ordinary people who believe in an extraordinary God, that God has gifted them to uniquely reach out to people like you and me. The least of these. And my faith has grown as a result of God putting in those, those people in my life to serve. And, and my, my assumption is your story is the same. This is how God uses us. This is the church. We are called to be servants. We are called to serve Jesus. So at the end of the day, you know, you stand face to face with Jesus. Here's what I know is not going to happen. You're not going to be getting to heaven and saying, where's my thank you card? Man, I worked hard. Where's my thank you card? You won't. You'll simply say this. As you see Jesus face to face, you'll say, Jesus, it was my pleasure, my pleasure to serve you. Amen? I want to invite our, uh, our worship teams to come forward as we um, close in worship and some of the campus's baptisms. Pretty exciting. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. It is life-giving. You're speaking to us today through your word to be who we are and our identity as servants of God, children of God, children who should serve because you love us. You first loved us. You gave your life for us. You redeemed us. You restored us. And so I pray more than anything, Lord, whether people are serving in the ministry, the children's ministry, the roots ministry, greeters, ushers, hospitality, counters, parking lot people, building and grounds, there's a whole host of different programs and teams that we have, or whether they're just being a part of an outreach team and serving the community. I pray first and foremost, Lord, that they would not walk out of here without knowing their why without a pure motive, without understanding that they, they do everything for an audience of one. When we grow weary, when we grow tired, and when we get frustrated, when, when we give effort to things that seem to, to just add to our stress, add to our tire, tired lives, I pray that we would reflect and remember, Jesus, this is all for you. And as we serve your bride, the church, Lord, I pray that you would accomplish your will, that you would do everything that you intend to do through your people. We love you. It is truly a pleasure to serve you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.